important. Um, so it's my, my great pleasure to introduce this panel. Um, and I'm going to start by introducing our moderator, Ger Gerard O'Leary. Um, Gerard is the co-founder and CTO of Univex Hero Technologies. He has also held positions previously at Emerald Devices and Arm. He received his bachelor's degree at the University of Galway, his MS and PhD degree at the University of Toronto, all in electrical and computer engineering. And for his research in integrated circuit design, he was a recipient of either the Lee Solid State Circuit Society Pre-Doctoral Achievement Award. Um, he's taken this research from the vet shop to commercial products and is the recipient of the RBC Prize for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And with that, I'll hand it over to Gerard to introduce the rest of the panel. Great. Thank you, Ricky. All right, and first, once again, I want to thank the organizers, so in particular, Ricky and Cynthia, for all of the work in pulling this panel together. So we have an amazing lineup here today. I'm very excited to chat about this topic. Um, so let's give them a round of applause. There we go. Great. Um, so I'm here as part of my involvement in the IEEE Solid State Circuits Directions Committee, but also because I represent, hopefully, a lot of the people in the audience and also sitting on this panel here who have taken their research in academia and they're looking to deploy it as kind of a commercial venture, trying to bring it into the real world and actually help people. Um, and so, again, we've assembled an amazing team who have you know, so much expertise around this, so we're looking forward to uh, chatting to everyone this evening. Um, so we'll start by going through an introduction for each of the eight panelists over about the next 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll get into some targeted questions and we'll open it up to questions from the audience uh, following that. So our first panelist is uh, Payam Hideri. So he's the Chancellor's Professor of Electrical Engineering, uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Irvine. He's an IEEE Fellow following his contributions to silicon-based millimeter wave integrated circuits and systems. He's the co-chair of the IEEE Solid State Circuits Directions Committee and he did his BS and MS in, in electrical engineering at Sharif University of Technology and his PhD at the University of Southern California. So now Payam will give his uh, one minute overview of some of his research as it relates to uh, BMEs. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. So what, uh, what better place to be than at the brain of each other? So I think that's good. Uh, so, um, my research really in brain machine interface really started uh, almost nine uh, years ago as a, a result of a collaboration with uh, a number of wonderful people uh, at UCI, USC, and Caltech. And the whole premise of this uh, research is to basically design a, a bi directional brain machine interface, uh, I would say invasive uh, brain machine interface that enables walking on patients with spinal cord injury. And to make the story short, that resulted in an $8 million of National Science Foundation grant uh, that basically created all these kind of activities that we are doing at UCI, Caltech, USC, and uh, it is truly positive story. I would be happy to uh, engage with you guys, and uh, if you guys have any questions, if uh, I can perhaps shed some light about the circuit we don't have to of the very interface, I would like to contribute. Okay. Great, thank you, Brian. Okay, so next up we have uh, Carolina. Um, so you're all familiar with Carolina at this point, I hope. So she's the principal member of technical staff and R&D team leader at IMEC. She did her PhD at KU Leuven, MSc at the Universidad Politecnica di Catalunya, and her BEng at the Universidad di Antiquea, all in electrical engineering. So as many of you learned in her fantastic talk yesterday, she is the lead, pro the project lead and architect of NeuroPixels. Um, so for those of you who might have missed her talk yesterday, um, Carly will give a quick overview of the work that she's doing at IMEC. Hi. Hi. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, so I wanted to show you a little bit today first what IMEC and other people have asked me and up today. So I'm a research research institute located in uh, Belgium, in the context of the university of uh, And uh, we are uh, an institute uh, busy with all sorts of technologies related to silicon, uh, nanotechnology, and specifically I'm working in the life science department. Uh, I'm in a group 
that these developing technologies for time to character. So we have work from wearables, screen plantables, to ingestibles, uh, and non contact devices as well. And my specific team is working on developing technologies for neurotech. Uh, so that uh, first little pixels is one of the examples. And uh, this has uh, changed a little bit uh, the game on uh, tools for electrophysiology. And this has become quite popular because the effort of our partners was on trying to develop a tool to give access to this tool to the foreign neuroscience community. Uh, I make it by the way a nonprofit organization, so all the work that we did with the pixels was also to make it a uh, very affordable and with time of seven of course. So that's why uh, the technology is so special because they want to make it broad enough that it can go to any lab. Uh, but as such, it's not a clinical tool, it's a research tool so that uh, it may be different to many of the things that we have seen uh, in this today. Uh, so yes, my background is in uh, electronic engineering. So my team is, of course, all busy with uh, CMOS design, uh, system design, uh, and innovations on all those sort of uh, uh, technology concepts. Uh, but of course, there are other things that I make that also contribute to the development. Great, thanks, Do you want to pass the mic on? All right, so next up we have Brooks Gross. So he's the program director of the Division of Translational Research at the NIH, sorry, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, also known as NINS. He leads the Brain Initiative for Next Generation Invasive Devices for Recording and Modulation in the Human Central Nervous System. He's the co lead of the Spark Corn in Initiative. He did his BS in neuroscience at the University of Florida, master's in biomedical engineering at the University of Michigan, and PhD in systems engineering at Oakland University. So Brooks will give a brief overview of the NINS device translation pipeline. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm one of many program directors in the division. Um, so as you can see up here, I just wanted to give you an overview of the NIDS's device translation pipeline. I'm one of a team of device um, uh, program directors, and we've created a program that spans both the Institute and Trans NIH initiatives. As you can see up top, we have the Brain Initiative, funding opportunities for neurotechnologies uh, in the lighter blue. Uh, we have other funding opportunities within NIDS, the dark blue, and we have the newly launched Blueprint MedTech program, which uh, aims to provide uh, contract resources to help people uh, translate easier. And our, our main goal overall, as you can see, is to fill, fill funding opportunities that go across the whole pipeline um, and, and basically uh, prevent people from falling you know, through the valley of death uh, so that when the time they exit this program, they would be able to attract VCs or, or larger companies to invest in them. Uh, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Rose. Alrighty, so next up we have Adam Steffler. Um, so Adam, oh sorry, one second here. Uh, so um, yeah, Adam is the CEO and co-founder of NTX Services. He's a board member and strategic advisor at Neurotech X. Previously, he was an associate at McKinsey and Company, Accuracy, HRS, Richter, and KPMG, um, with various roles across strategy and investments. So he's also a chartered financial analyst, chartered professional accountant, chartered alternative investment analyst, and professional risk manager. So Adam will give an overview of some of the services that are offered uh, by NTX. Sure, thank you. So I, I decided to present essentially the, the wheel of services and support we provide to companies in the field of neurotechnology. Um, and the reason I did this is because what's often underestimated is how many disciplines are required to succeed in commercializing neurotech and how much interaction there is with each. So, you know, having strong neuroscience in, in research is one component, but if you don't have a clear plan when it comes to hardware and software engineering, IP strategy, regulation, clinical trials, how one can influence the other, what's the market you're going for, how all of this can impact fundraising. Should you have a sales strategy? You do it internally or externally? There are a lot of questions that need to be answered. Um, I don't think every startup needs to have all the answers, but they should at least be able to take a step back and understand that these are considerations to look at. 
they can get support for a lot of these considerations. Uh, they might get better at it as they grow in size, but they should at least kind of be able to get support and have a sense of what's coming. So uh, I'm happy to answer questions later on, which probably will touch upon a couple of those topics, but at least it gives a, an overall overview of uh, what we get from them. Alrighty, so next up we have Jacob. So hopefully many of you could have attended his talk yesterday. So he's the co-founder and CEO of Multi, Multi Neurotech. Uh, so he's an associate, also an associate professor at Rice University, a founding member of the IEEE Neuroethics Working Group, and a former co-chair of IEEE Brain. He won the 2022 Rice Charles Duncan Award for Outstanding Academic Achievement. He did his BS in Physics at UCLA and a PhD in Applied Physics at Cornell University. So for those of you who may have missed the talk yesterday, you're going to give a brief overview uh, of the work you're doing at Motif. Yeah, thanks. So, um, so I started Motif with some colleagues, uh, Samir Shad, the neurosurgeon, and Samir Shad, neurologist, and I wanted to watch engineer. And for many of the reasons, actually, that Ricky started her company, was we didn't want it to die in the field. Uh, we didn't want it to die in the lab, and we realized that, you know, to take the concept of creating minimally invasive miniature neural interfaces would require resources that we weren't able to muster with in the lab. And so we're trying to basically bridge that gap between what's possible with non-invasive neurotechnologies, um, you know, in terms of access and um, acceptance from patients, and combine that with the specificity that, and uh, the signals and noise that you can get with invasive technology um, to create, to basically bridge that divide between invasive and, and non-invasive and create a minimally invasive platform. So I hope I'll have that. Jacob. All right, so next up we have Adil, who I think you may remember from today's talk. So um, Adil is the CEO and founder of Psionic. He was one of MIT Technology Review's top 35 innovators under 35. He did his BS in biology and MS in computer science at Loyola University Chicago, an MS in ECE, and a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, so if you want to take a minute maybe to give an overview of the uh, work you're doing, Adil? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh... Uh, we built bionic hands uh, that are functional and acceptable for everyone. Uh, and so uh, I've got it right over here. This is the bionic ability hand um, that's made for people who have lost their hands. And um, this is uh, started off as my PhD work, and I wanted to make sure that, that it could impact as many people as possible. So we had commercialized it at the company and started bionic. Um, and it's the fastest bionic hand in the world. It's the first one with touch feedback built in. Um, and it's uh, covered by Medicare in the US. And so that was our goal all along. And um, uh, we just um, just uh, released it commercially, or clinically across the entire US last September. And it's available globally to researchers as of I think, last week. And uh, we're in the middle of a crowdfunding round too. So it's an um, opportunity that we've got this panel here with um, entrepreneurs and investors um, here as well in this space. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next up we have Ryan Tom, who is the founder and managing director at, at Kaleida Capital. In the past life, she was an investor at Anzu Partners and an associate at Shock's Patent Group. She did her BS in material science and MNG, and MS, sorry, in material science and engineering, an MS in bioengineering, and a PhD in bioengineering, all at Stanford University. She led interdisciplinary research projects in neural interfaces, brain mapping, and electronic skin with co-advisors, including Carl Weitzeroff and Jenna Bell. And last but not least, we have Joanne Wong, who is the 2022 Chair of IEEE Entrepreneurship. She's a partner at Reds Capital, co-founder of Science Hub, and Executive Director at Cancer Computer. She did her Bachelor's of Engineering at McGill University and is a member of the Quebec Order of Engineers. Great. Okay, so next up, we will have some targeted questions for the panelists, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. Uh, so I want to kind of take through the, the discussions along the journey of taking neurotechnology developed in an academic setting and deploying it as a commercial product. So we're going to start with uh, I think we can pass it. Uh, so the first question is uh, around integrated circuits. So early medical devices were built using many discrete components for things like power management, uh, data acquisition, wireless power transmission, etc. And so, you know, a key driver of this neurotechnology revolution has come about through, you know, minimizing device volumes, maximizing power consumption. So integrated circuits have played a huge role here. And we have many IC designers in the audience. Um, so what advice would you give to them for if they want to pursue a career in neurotechnology and taking these types of integrated circuits and pushing these innovations to an actual device that can be deployed? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, 
so I would like to also make it the resemblance between perhaps uh, the newer technology domain and the communication domain. So in the communication domain, where the integrated circuit made lots of contribution, uh, the point of barrier uh, to uh, make a contribution to communication industry is completely different from newer technology for the following reason. Uh, so students who are basically doing integrated circuit design for uh, newer technological application, they have to understand a language that at the beginning is uh, sort of foreign to them because uh, they have to take perhaps courses, they have to get a, a fundamental knowledge about uh, newer science perhaps, and then get themselves familiar with the challenges, uh, the real challenges in the neuroscience, neuro, uh, biology technology, neuro, neurobiology, and translate it to engineering. So this effort has been done uh, in the domain of communication theory related to integrated circuits. Uh, this is well, well established. So uh, what it means here is that that's a great opportunity perhaps for, uh, for uh, institutions of higher education to perhaps pursue a model that is, uh, in my view, successful uh, in the context of communication theory applied to integrated circuits and then leading to all these uh, wonderful advancements. So what is lacking here first uh, is to establish that multidisciplinary effort or inter interdisciplinary effort for education that basically leads to this uh, knowledge of multiple fields, but also uh, the unique opportunity that we have in neurotechnology that uh, perhaps doesn't exist uh, any longer in communication industry is that uh, we see uh, this kind of rise of uh, a sort of companies uh, in this domain. Uh, people who are familiar with the uh, communication technology, uh, founding and establishing a company in that domain is not that easy because you know we have lots of big players, uh, lots of technology have, have been commoditized. But here, there is a, a huge opportunity. Of course, there is a big elephant in this room, which is uh, FDA and all these kind of regulations. And uh, in fact, I'm also very curious to see how <coughs> Uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, in general, the U.S. industry and uh, the U.S. Uh, effort in terms of streamlining all of this regulation will work so that uh, uh, innovators can make a contribution and can have success with a sort of company. So this is really a challenge that uh, you know I'm not an expert to uh, address that challenge, but I think that uh, exists. Uh, and for that reason, I would like to say that. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult uh, for students to find uh, an opportunity, despite the fact that the landscape is there to uh, to make a contribution. So let me give you an example. Uh, so the recent graduates in my group, and I, I'm uh, quite raising a very big group, about 12 students, and uh, maybe six of them are right now working on brain machine interface related activities. But they end up working at companies such as Apple, Broadcom, and Qualcomm and in the sensor design part. Uh, so what it means here is that the established companies are not there in this domain, but that is a unique opportunity. As I said, you know, what it means here is that lots of entrepreneurship can be done. But again, we have to resolve the challenge of uh, the regulations that are not really as tough as other uh, engineering disciplines. Right. I think regulations is a huge issue, but there's another elephant in the room when it comes to IC design, and that's really licensing and CAD tools. So, for example, when you're you know you develop these ICs in academia, but to start your own company, you know there's there's a huge issue with IP and getting to use the the types of processes that you would want to use for starting a company. So, all right, I know there's a kind of a big push now towards like open source integrated circuits. Um, any any comments on you know what students can do uh, to kind of overcome right. those challenges? So, uh, I think that was the reason that we came with it. So the sort of direction, uh, really kind of uh, initiated some effort to sort of democratize IC design. And what it means here is that uh, a company such, uh, named Skywater, uh, in collaboration with Google, they approach uh, the sort of society, and uh, their idea was to kind of streamline the IC design. People who are doing uh, integrated circuit design, they know that uh, you know uh, the IC design is very costly. Uh, you have to fabricate and then have to pay and all this sort of stuff and have access to the uh, design kits. So some of these uh, uh, 
I would say overheads uh, have been at least sky butter uh, and for that matter Google try to tackle this fundamental issue in IC design and streamline the IC application so that uh, you know everyone can have access to it and the design of the circuits layout fabrication could be as easy as uh, like a software design engineer uh, or doing the software so hopefully uh, this is a start and Google has started this I think that's a huge potential for people who are doing IC design for uh, a number of applications, including, including new interfaces and uh, other applications. Great. Yeah, that's a really exciting development. So looking forward to seeing these open source neural interface ICs coming soon. Great. Um, so the next question is for Carolina. So IMEC has a long history of spinning out companies. On your website alone, there's a list of 118 startups. So what is the process like for these spin outs? And what are some of your favorite success stories? Yeah, great. Very good question. So, indeed, um, I make a uh, research institute uh, received a lot of support from the Belgian government as well as part of the funding. And uh, one of the conditions for that is that I make should contribute to the economy and development uh, of the country and as such, it has certain goals on uh, contributing also to the economy. Uh, many um, of the people working at IMEC are actually PhD students in Porto. And um, so many of the ideas that come from those research uh, are normally then take or they try to take it up to a spin off. So, as I mentioned, IMEC is non profit. So, want to develop something uh, very interesting, IMEC kind of profit. So, either we license them. Or the PhD or the researcher that has it uh, will then uh, get a lot of support uh, to a spin off that company. So, IMEC has its own investment uh, uh, unit, let's call it like that, uh, where we try to look for ideas that are interested enough to uh, try to push them a step forward. So, that initial support either comes from IMEC or uh, from external uh, parts as well. Uh, yeah, interesting idea. Uh, no, there's yeah, many nothing maybe related to neurotech uh, yet, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but there has been a lot of ideas on imagers, uh, which is uh, uh, a very big success from from my side. Uh, also on IF that has um, yeah, uh, a lot of. Uh, um, or, or yeah, or, or types of uh, links related to to our uh, meaningful way. There are many things from that direction as well. Uh, also, on large area electronics, uh, there's also some uh, attempts uh, or, or yeah, good success as well. Uh, so yeah, there's there's many things, but uh, not so uh, many related maybe to to neurotech. Yeah, it's a really interesting model that IMEC has, and especially being not for profit, which really brings us to our next question, which is about non dilutive funding. Uh, so, uh, to, to Brooks, I mean, it, yeah, there's so many initiatives that are being offered here. And the question is, what is one piece of advice you would give to people who are looking to leverage these programs? Are there common pitfalls that you see in some applications? Any, any general advice to people in the audience who might be looking to apply to some of these initiatives? Yeah, I would say that uh, one of the issues is awareness of the programs. Um, I even have uh, PIs in my portfolio that are unaware of the other programs that we've created uh, to be more versatile. And, and, you know, it's like basically like going to an ice cream store and you have different flavors of the same thing. Um, and, and that's because there's no one funding opportunity is, is a perfect design for all the different types of projects that are out there. Um, so I, I would say that the best thing to do is to contact us. And uh, you know, our whole team, which is led by Nick Langfoss, who started the original uh, funding program, and we've just been expanding since over the past say, three to five years. Uh, we've gone from having you know 15 projects at once, which we thought a lot for, to now almost 100 projects. So, and the money that we've invested in, into these projects is pretty astounding, I would say. Um, so. I'd say reach out to us and we'll try to help direct you in the right, right direction. And uh, there are other resources with the small businesses like uh, C3I or right? Anchor um, and Emily Caparella in IPS uh, runs our the small business program. So she'd be another person to talk with. Um, I, I, I think everyone will have access to an electronic version of a 
the uh, handout. And in that, we actually have hyperlinks to a lot of our programs. And we have our, our general email contact. So um, please reach out to us. It is non dilutive funding. Um, oftentimes, though, people, they, they don't um, know where to, to go to look for the right information to go about translating. And uh, I think that that's the missing key. And we're trying to create educational programs on that. I know some universities have their own programs already in that. but educating people at least in the base knowledge uh, so they know who to ask or what type of people to ask in the different processes and so forth. Like, so considering reimbursement is a big one. Uh, regulatory issues is another big one. These things are questions to start exploring before you apply to our funding opportunities. Not that you have to have your ID or IRB approval before applying, but but just to be aware of all these challenges and, and survey the landscape. I mean, anyone can Google IP, you know, that, that's protected and try to figure out ways to get around it so they don't run into those issues later on. Great. Yeah, thanks for that information. I want to continue that question with the deal because, you know, in some of our discussions, we've been chatting about, you know, non dilutive funding and you, you really managed to leverage those programs. So I guess to other potential founders in the room, do you have any advice, you know, from the inside about how to leverage these programs? Um, yeah, so at, um, at the University of Illinois, we're really fortunate because I, I, I assume a lot of the big universities have these programs that help you uh, to put together grants for SBIRs in particular, right? Um, and uh, we have the Technology Entrepreneurship Center at the University of Illinois. There's tech transfer offices at every university, right, that, that help in these regards in, in order to get these non dilutive non fund grants. And so we got two NSF phase ones that became two NSF phase two awards in particular that really transformed our company, right? It, it, it was like one of those make or break moments where it was like, the, like once we got that grant, we knew that we could, we could then survive, right? Um, and then like, Quit our date or like not become students anymore, and then and actually go full time with the company um, on one of those grants. And um, it was those resources that really helped um, uh, those university resources in particular. And, and honestly, there's there's other resources in town as well that um, and uh, we use like when we were at Champagne, when we had the um, Small Business Development Center, the SBDC, and San Diego has that same thing too. So one of the first things that we did when we moved here is that we got in contact with the SBDC, and then like they put us in contact with like a bunch of like um, uh, just resources available in the area, right? So. Um, and that that's all free as well, right? That those are the resources provided you to, uh, by the city. So those are also like non dilutive funding mechanisms, very common stuff that you can get. Um, and there's just a plethora of these resources that you can take advantage of for sure. Great, yeah, it's great advice that people should tap into. So I want to bring it back to Adam uh, again on the kind of funding side of things. So NTX services, you've got clients and industry contacts all over the globe. Can you comment on how the funding kind of landscape is different between these different regions? And uh, just the general ecosystems for neurotechnology, how it differs between, you know, Asia versus Europe versus North America? Sure, of course. So we're, we're lucky that, you know, we have a team in Canada and in the U.S., but we have clients and collaborators in Europe, in Asia, and across North America. So we try to have a global landscape. We believe there's talent and there are, there are a lot of opportunities, again, in many, many countries. So we like to talk to companies. We also like to talk to investors, to your point, on a global basis. Before we get to investors, maybe I'll get to non dilutive funding. So I think the U.S. you know is very well equipped in that regard. It's interesting to see that in other countries, let's say Canada or Singapore, um, there are a lot of programs that are also aimed at connecting research to industry. So if a company in Canada collaborates with a lab, eighty percent of that project could be refunded in some cases. Uh, in Singapore, you also have organizations that try to match researchers to companies that can literally go try to meet PIs and try to see if they can license technology to integrate it to their own activities. So it's quite interesting to see that non dilutive can take different shapes and forms. And we've seen a lot of collaborations and efforts from the government to get academia and corporates to actually work together. Um, in terms of investors, and let, let's take the VC landscape, if you think about, you know, C, Series A, and so on. Um, I would say it's less about the geography. It's a lot about the focus of the fund. You know, you have med tech funds, you have funds that are broader technology fund, you have some that are more on the consumer side. So I think, first of all, it's about finding the right fit. Once that's that, you know, the conversation you always have is, what do I need to understand as a fund? So there's market risk and there's technological risk. I mean, obviously there's more than that, but these are the main categories. So what we often hear is, and especially hard at the C level is, 
how can you prove to me that there's a market for your solution? You don't have too many competitors. You know how to get to the patients. You can convince you know clinicians to prescribe your solution, et cetera, et cetera. And in parallel, that you have a very strong basis for your technology, and you think you can get there. So even though the burden of proof is obviously lower for early stage companies, what we often hear from VCs is, you know, it was interesting. Maybe I'll go there the next round. But at this point, I, for the ticket size that I'm going to put in, I'm not willing or I can't do all the work to go there. So I'd rather have other investors figure it out, the ones that are even more specialized than I am, or the ones that are willing to take a bet, I'll come in later on. So this is where, again, the non dilute funding help, the collaboration with the industry help. And another thing that I would say that is, uh, I think, not talked about as much is the collaborations with strategics. We talk to pharmas, we talk to med techs, uh, we talk to tech companies, and we sometimes hear a little bit of fear from startups that says, you know, are they going to take my idea and kill it, or what's going to happen? The truth is, when we talk to those organizations, they're quite excited, actually, to learn more. Uh, we worked with a pharma that was looking at, you know, what are the digital therapeutic solutions out there? Can it complement my own solutions, not replace them? You know, not take the idea and put it in the, in the cupboard, but really, how can I do something with my solution, the drug that I might have, and also use another solution? So, I would say the landscape is interesting. Obviously, the US has more with the Neurotech dedicated fund. The US uh, typically more funding towards Neurotech in general. But it, it, if I would advise, you know, a, a startup at, you know, wherever stage they're at, I would say think about, again, non diluted. VC, strategic, there's more than one player out there, and you probably might end up actually with a mix of all of those, and that could provide you also with a lot of expertise that might be required. Sure, great advice. Yeah, so I guess going back to the formation of a neurotech company, so so Jacob, Motif is a really exciting example, you know, that has emerged from academia. So how have you found this process, and do you have any advice to potentially other PIs who are in the audience who are thinking about starting their own company? How on, this you maybe? Very <laughs> Uh, it's super hard. Um, yeah. So um, I don't know. I, maybe it's not the right time to ask this question. Uh, back after your series. Yeah. Again. No. So so we're we're like very close to closing our seat. I'll probably feel better in two weeks. Um, but you know, I think part of why um, I wanted to do it was to just better understand the process of commercialization and also. Because I believed in the tech that we were building and I didn't see it on a path forward. And honestly, it was like out of a sense. Like that, that's the real truth. I, I desperately wanted someone else to do it. Um, and I think that would have been wise for my lifestyle. So it, 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 it is a challenging thing to do. I don't want to sugar, I don't have enough sugar putting it. Um, but I think, um, so that's the first thing to understand. Okay, well, you're, what are you getting yourself into? Okay, how about that positive effect? Um, so what, what I think was, was helpful for me, um, you were talking, you know, specifically to other PIs with the question. Right, exactly. So I think the, the, the advantage that I had as a PI is that I already had a network of, of colleagues and friends who had started companies before. Um, and I think that's a, you, you have that advantage relative to someone who just maybe has a great idea out of the lab, a little bit harder to get in there. Um, meaning, you know, give more introductions to, to VCs. So leverage your network, try and bring as much help on. I know it's, um, there's a community of people, if you, if you know other founders and you're thinking about it, they will tell you all about it, like how challenging it is. It's kind of like when you have kids and like everyone is telling you, like, you should have kids, kids are great. And you had a kid and they're like, and you're like, oh my God, it's so hard. It's like, yeah. Right. It is like now, here it is. Like, I don't know. Um, and so it's kind of like that with running a company. Everyone's like, you should have a company, you should have a company. And you start going, you're like, oh, that's harder. Like, yeah, yeah, it is, right? So then, but the first thing is that we're all super supportive of each other. We've all gone through it. So when I found that I wanted to run a talk, and I talked to the founders, like, they want to events, like, because they know how hard it is and how hard it is to get funding early on. So find those other founders. Um, once that you once they know you're thinking about it, they're going to be your like close colleagues and friends. Great. Uh, I think just sticking on that point, so your example of kids and, and startups, I think in both cases, you really sacrifice sleep. That's a key thing. So uh, do you have any advice for kind of managing a work-life balance? Well, again, maybe it's a difficult time to ask this question, but in general, any general advice for how to manage that? 
Do your best. Yeah, fair. Uh, no, I mean, it's only the best. I'll always tell you more. There's, there's a certain amount of time that I dedicate this to doing work. And I have to fit everything that I have to do into that amount of time. And I think what ends up happening is that other things will slow down. So in my case, I'm a professional youth. So my lab is slowing down a little bit. Um, we're not publishing as frequently as we have. I think, you know, papers on my desk for a little bit longer. So that's how I've been able to manage it. Like, I fix the amount of time that I'm spending the work and that, that, that does work out. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so moving on a little bit in the, in the later stages, I want to get to funding. And so one interesting approach that's kind of emerging now is crowdfunding. So a deal, uh, you know, there's Kickstarter, Start Engine. I know you're you're pitching right now. So what has been your experience and are there any catches? Um, yeah, so uh, there, there are a number of reasons why we decided to go to crowdfunding route in particular, right? And so we're all about accessibility of, of, our, of our product, right? So as many people as possible, and it's in our blood, right? So accessibility of the company also makes sense to us um, personally. So we want to make it as accessible as possible for anyone to get involved uh, who wants to be involved in the company. Um, but also some of the things that I may have mentioned before too, so like um, a lot of our, our videos, the um, that go on social media. We, we've um, generated half of our sales through social media and for a medical device company, that's usually unheard of, right? We usually have sales reps that go to all the clinics and everything. And um, we wanted the crowdfunding basically to double as you know, we get investment money to come in, but also uh, like in the, in the two weeks that we've been running it, like we've had 10 patients already contact us like about when we get our hands and we've been in contact with their clinician and the insurance to get that build and everything as well. Um, so it just it just made a lot of logical sense um, for us in particular to go down that route um, because we had a lot of visibility online. We we had this uh, this following of people that really wanted to support our mission, and, uh, and we we're just doing like you know really fun and cool stuff that we just want people to be involved with uh, as well. Uh, and and we our pre seed round we did raise through angel investors and VCs and. Um, and uh, as you guys uh, might know and may have been seeing uh, over the last year is that like um, a lot of the VCs have been like uh, less uh, willing to go in and, and valuations are going down and, and things like that because of the market and everything like that. It might take another like, year or two for it to, to recover. And so um, we decided that it was in our best uh, option then to, to leverage the, our strengths, which was um, like our community and then going to Go that route. Mm -hmm. Great. So that leads us nicely to our next question. So for Ariane, so based on your experience at Kaleida Capital, um, how do you see the funding landscape evolving over the next few years, particularly with regard to neurotech companies? Yeah, certainly. So uh, as, as we've seen today and in all the discussions uh, previous have discussed, um, I think that the environment for uh, neurotechnology is highly optimistic in terms of the different types of technologies that are coming out and um, the value that's to be created. Um, you know, as you'll mention, yeah, the, the funding investment the market, the market investment has been um, a little bit difficult uh, both for founders and um, you know, uh, for a lot of for a lot of um, that uh forethought. But I think that uh, things are probably gonna pick up starting next year. And um uh I think it's I think it's a really exciting time, and and so uh, Collider Capital actually has a special interest in investing in the seed stage um, neurotechnologies uh, coming out, and that's really across a broad spectrum of things, including diagnostics, uh, medical devices, and therapeutic discovery. Um, and we're really positioned to solve a lot of that funding gap and carry on a lot of the work that team is, is handling over NIH, and so we want to be able to carry that forward and really ignite um, a lot of the activity. And I think there needs to be dedicated um, venture capital um, activity. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully all that will turn out very well. Great. Yeah, it's great to hear such a positive perspective. Yes. So maybe, Joanne, do you share the same sentiment? Do you think that the future is bright from the right capital perspective? Yeah. So with Res, we invest at pre-seed level. So we work with uh, some of our companies that started with academic researchers. So we're willing to be at that early stage and help and move them along and develop. Uh, our investment has been global, uh, in particular in Israel. And but we invested in Canada, the US, Korea, and Israel because that's where the partners are located. And it, it has been a challenging year. And we, uh, we all felt like we pulled back 
uh, this year just because of the economic situation and uh, uh, what we found a lot of other VCs have done so, and they focus on their own portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. And because uh, we've seen valuations drop, some valuations, uh, I'm not saying only our startups, but some valuations have dropped by over a half in a year. So if you're in the fundraising mode, you got to just manage that in the sense of, uh, uh, of when you're going out to fundraise, yes, you need the cash, but if you can go through undiluted spending all the better, uh, but you need the cash so that you take a hit from the valuation. And obviously it, it, it hits you and also your present investors and everything that sort. I'll just mention something with an eye to green entrepreneurship, one of the things we're trying to do this, is an entity with an eye to green is open for all, with all societies and also all regions. And what we're trying to do is build up uh, services for aspiring entrepreneurs or some of these that are here today. And so one of them we have uh, developed, let's say, uh, a, a support channel via Slack for women entrepreneurs, including aspiring entrepreneurs who are in postdocs or docs uh, in your doctorate studies and you want to say, hey, we want to explore this. So we built a channel for that that you can meet up with other aspiring entrepreneurs or women, other women entrepreneurs. So to build that global network around. The other part that we looked at, and I listened to some of the presentation yesterday, is the challenge of what you're doing here is you're building your technology in the lab, but the challenge is how do you commercialize it? And how do you expand it? So one of the things we're looking at with an IGB entrepreneurship is finding those manufacturing resources. And it doesn't mean you have to send it to China. Uh, for the simple reason, I'm ignoring the geopolitics right now. But in, in Asia, they want volume. They want in the millions. They're not really interested in a little prototype. But there are resources locally. Well, I'll just talk right now in the States, especially in the Midwest, there are excellent companies there not just from helping with the circuit design from a semiconductor perspective, but you've got to look at the first level packaging. And so the stuff that you're building in your lab, and if you don't have the idea in your head of how this can be manufactured in huge volumes, you're going to have to do a lot of redesign. So you've got to work with those manufacturing facilities to help you, guide you that way. Are you choosing the right uh, uh, products the materials to make that happen. I'm looking at your hand, I presume you've done a lot of uh, iterations there, but if you end up working with a manufacturing company that, that is able to do that, so what we want to do is build those resources. So we've got a team right now, and they're all volunteers because it's all actually big numbers, and to build those resources out that when you're looking at that and building this, uh, is that you're able to go to that next step. And the other part that we're looking at is when we've been doing these conversations. The first question that comes out of people's mouth, and I think that you probably all felt it here too, well, we want to meet investors, okay? But there is a challenge. You can't just meet an investor. you got to be ready, not just for that meeting, not just for your pitch deck, but the follow-up. And so right now with an IGB entrepreneurship, we're not competing against the resources only that sit out there, but we're putting on the focus on deep tech, which includes neurotech and that tech. Uh, I say anything that comes from patents from university research, we have to put a lot of time and effort into it. And also there's a hardware component. So we're in the process of trying to figure out how to build up a network of deep tech investors that will be made available to the community with I to read so that you can approach them, but approach them intelligently because sometimes you just don't want a shot at it. I actually probably do some of the work that Adam has been doing, uh, but not exclusively in neural tech. And, and build this out and see how we can build this up and connect investors. Like one of the accelerators I've been working with out of Singapore and um, and Luton, but you probably know her. Yeah. She she has sent me a list of about 200 deep tech investors. Okay. Then the challenge is a lot of these deep tech investors, they invest at theory day. You're aspiring. You're not going to reach there. <laughs> okay. So we're trying to find those pre C and C investors. Yes, you will meet the angels, and but it's once you go beyond your angels and your friends and family, where are those investors? And I think in the U.S. you have less of the challenge, but the challenge is, is greater when you're outside that the region. I know in Europe it's a bit tough also because most of them are in the U.K. or Germany, but if you're not in there, what happens? So what happens if you're in Middle East Africa? So those are the challenges that we're trying to figure out how to build this out. So. 
We need your feedback to know what are we doing in the right direction, or if you are, should we be going in a different direction as services that I can be entrepreneurship can offer you. Sorry, no, that's great. Place. Such great advice. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. Um, yeah. And you you touched on the key point there, which is even just in getting to the seed stage. One issue that I think a lot of people in this room might be facing is the general component, semiconductor component shortage. I can speak personally that we've had to go through so many redesigns just based on you know what is available for, for very fundamental types of ICs. So maybe a question to the panelists: like, have you is has this affected you in any way, or do you have any advice for circumventing this? Nobody has a solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, uh, it definitely affected us um, for sure, right? And we had like uh, seven, we have seven STM32 micro um, controllers in here, right? And they just don't make them anymore. And the automotive companies bottled them up, right? Uh, and so we had to redesign all the electronics in the hand itself to use a more ubiquitously available uh, microcontroller. And uh, I mean that was that was I mean we're a small company right we we don't have like a million developers who can like like uh, dedicate uh, their entire resources to that right uh, but there was silver linings to that and one of the silver linings was that what we switched to a a uh, microcontroller that was like a fifth of the cost went down to like five dollars to a dollar a piece it was um, it was less powerful but in in being less powerful we had to rewrite our code to make it like a thousand times more efficient um, than it was before and that had that enabled like way better torque control in, in motors right so um, in doing that process like like you can spin these bad situations into ones that actually are advantageous um, you know, to you as well uh, so that was that was kind of how we like got out of that too is that like it, it helped us to make the, the product even better in that redesign process great outcome fantastic Adam. you know we, we've seen it too and i mean what we've tried to do is we've actually helped a few companies connect to new suppliers but there were a couple of questions right uh do they speak my language do they have all the certifications i need is it exactly what i need and am i big enough to be even be of interest to them so there was almost a pitch we had to do on behalf of the company to said, look you know this is where they're heading working with them they're doing great and you know big dv or other clients we could break you down the road so it was a little tricky but as a startup by yourself trying to figure that out i think it was a it was a big issue that we kept hearing mm -hmm. i would say company after company yeah, at some point so right interesting so I think you've been exposed to a lot of companies in this space. And I know like personally, how we've managed this is pretty much porting any ICs we can get a hold of. But if everyone's doing that, then we're adding to the problem. So it's kind of the, the death viral. So have you noticed that trend too with other startups or? Now, I think it depends where um, what we've seen also is if you're very deep in the R&D stage, right? Some of them have also refocused their efforts into different aspects, right? Literally saying, okay, I'm not going to ride this wave. I'm going to focus on other certifications that I'm working on, on the software aspect of it, on different aspects of my R&D, uh, accepting that they would not get all the devices ready when they initially thought the costs were just too prohibitive and, you know, they kind of reshuffle a little bit. But yeah, to your point, I think there was a point where there's a little bit of a no solution approach, but I think what you said is great. I mean, we found also new suppliers, new vendors, and actually new relationships where I would say vendors that would not necessarily have been the first pick ended up being it. And, you know, they also managed to prove that they could support startups, which I think is a great position. Great. So there is a silver lining. Great to hear. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to the audience members. Does anyone have a question that they'd like to address to the panel? Hi, I'm uh, Majid. I'm from uh, CLA. It's the, let's say it's the French uh, IMAC. <laughs> you know, with a couple of colleagues <laughs> over there next to Soleiman. Uh, and so uh, my question is it's part of a common question. So thank you for the panel. And to one of the points that uh, Jacob made uh, with the, uh, the system that his company is made is will develop is to take to, to go in between the wearable acceptance and the specificity of uh, devices. Um, but if you look at what's being developed these days in the neurotech for health and wellness, which is the title of the, of the, whole, of the whole workshop, it's mainly in the non-invasive space. And uh, of course, when companies take, take like smart sensors when they made them or take them out of the shelf, have the great, greatest algorithms ever, and the digital and uh, environments around that. But that's not what we do here, hopefully. And so, um, Ariane and Joanne, maybe Adam or anyone on the panel, what's your take about this divide between this non-invasive, quick, quick to the market? There's a lot of people doing this, 
and the specific specificity that most of the people in the, in the room are doing, what the anything, any tips that we could use to go them to the DC the best way possible. Maybe I'll take the, I have the mic, so I'll take a second. Um, it's a great question. And so what we often say is, who are you trying to target? Like, what does the patient want? What do they need? Because oftentimes, I mean, you know, if you have a beautiful technology, it doesn't mean that the patient won't care if it doesn't really help them in what they need. And the more complex you are, the more scary in some way you could be. So I would say try and solve something that your technology makes sense for. Try to make sure, validate that with the both the medical community and the patient community that this is something that's needed. And, you know, I could say the simplest, the better, but there's cases where you actually need a complex solution. So it's more about the matching. Um, and it's a question we often hear, whether you're a digital therapeutic software only solution or you are an inventive solution, you know, what are the different use cases that I should consider? And within each of the disorder, which subset makes sense for me? So I would say that this is the part that needs to be really analyzed. There's a lot of KOL interviews also that can make a lot of sense. People underestimate the importance of different actors in the ecosystem. Uh, caregivers, for example, matters a lot. The caregiver will have a say. So if you have a technology that's friendly, that could help a lot. So I, I would just say really understand what's needed and then make sure it's matched. One maybe quick point on a non-invasive and sim simpler, let's say, technological solution. Um, there's a lot of efforts from the regulatory bodies also to define not just software as a medical device, but what, it, what are digital therapeutics? So when we were just in Asia actually a few days ago, and South Korea came up with standards that are very specific to that. Uh, and a lot of countries are trying to say, let's stop, let's harmonize, and let's make sure that we can get the solutions to market quickly. So, you know, I think both should coexist. Uh, we see both worlds. Sometimes the, you know, highly medical solutions are not aware of what's on the other side, but vice versa. Some of the other solutions are not really sure what's being done in, you know, deep med, med tech. In our mind, it's just about, it's a continuous line and it just needs to make sense for the patients, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, that was an awesome answer. I definitely agree. Um, as an engineer and having a tinkered a lot in the lab, um, I know what it's like to get really super excited about um, some really incredible uh, functional features of the technology. But oftentimes, though, when you start thinking about you know putting a business model together around that, um, oftentimes a lot of founders that we see come through at the early stage have trouble identifying uh, what kinds of indications they do need to go for and what might be kind of the best uh, low hanging fruit, so to speak, that still brings a lot of impact, but it's also achievable within a certain amount of funding, a certain amount of timeline, and uh, the milestones that you can demonstrate to a potential investor. Um, all those things are super important. Um, I would also say that uh, I had a lot of experience post grad school um, working on intellectual property and helping founders to strategize around what does their core technology actually enable um, in light of the prior art and in consideration of other market solutions. Um, and that activity, walking through that uh, kind of side by side with the, uh, the co founders of the company and their technical teams. Uh, really helping them to understand and appreciate, you know, hey, well, what does actually like a higher resolution uh, pigeon get you to do? And, you know, what are, what are the actionable data that, that comes out of that? And how does that impact translate, um, you know, the, the patient population that, that you're looking at? And so um, certainly a lot of those, it's, it's almost like a subtle change in, in the perspective of how you view your own uh, science and achievements to date, but also kind of putting a, an additional perspective on it um, that has a much more deep understanding of the, of the folks you're trying to serve. Um, another thing to consider is also um, uh, thinking about how much capital you're going to need um, and, and matching that as well um, to, to the indication or the, the product or service that you want know, to provide. That's great advice. Um, so you, you touched on a key point there, which is IP. Um, sorry, no, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully include you in this answer too. So um, I think that's something that a lot of founders often underappreciate, especially coming from academia. We're so focused on publishing. D do any of the founders in particular have advice on how to manage IP or how you've worked with the universities to uh, smoothen that process or, or maximize the utility of the, the patents that you're filing potentially? <laughs> Well, 
I mean, <laughs> if it's a touchy subject, we can. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so for the university, um, uh, tech transfer offices are just different degrees of terrible. <laughs> 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 um, and that it's a conclusion. Fortunately, many of the investors know this, um, and so they will be somewhat patient with you. Um, what we found um, is that you know having an option agreement in place, you're working on your license, you're gonna you're gonna get a license eventually because you're one of the inventors. That's okay, at least for us in terms of early stage funding. And then, um, but I think very quickly you want to be able to establish an off-campus presence where you can develop your independent IP portfolio. They're going to want to see something that's completely controlled by the company. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't happen have to happen right away. Um, yeah, along those lines. Um, so out of the four patents that we have, um, the first one was the only one that was was truly developed like that. That was a graduate student, right? Um, but we were fortunate that, that we were able to negotiate with our office of technology management to give us the rights to the IP. And um, and so Psionic ended up filing um, for it instead. And um, and then the, the, the other patents, we, we just filed for on our own. Um, and that way we were able to have maintain complete ownership um, over the IP. And you know, the other thing we said here too is that it's not necessarily the worst thing to have a university involved because then you've got the backing of the university, right? And if it's a really like a, a well-known one, right, then then like if it's like you know, Stanford or Harvard University of Illinois or British Engineering School or something like that, right? Then it's like, yeah, they 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 thought they believed in it enough to actually get get a, get a patent on it, right? So that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and for us, we did a lot of cross marketing with the university as well. So they they got like return, I guess, uh, in some sense out of that, right? Just by using like, look, like our students developed the bionic limb, right? Um, and, and that there's other ways to for universities and, and the, the companies to work together that doesn't always have to revolve around IP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, Jacob. So, yeah, I mean, people have really varying experiences when it comes to dealing with TTOs at university. Honestly, I've had great experiences at the University of Toronto, so props to them. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, some universities handle all the patent costs and you, you, you know, you pay them at a certain threshold, you know, based on revenue or based on, you know, an, an exit. Um, so I think some universities are, are doing it well, so it really varies between institutions. Um, yeah. So any other questions from the audience? <laughs> um, so I, I think everyone in this room knows that projects never go as planned, at least they never go by the first plan, right? So I'm wondering, do you guys have any anecdotes or advice for how to, if it bugs in the features or I mean, cautionary tales for um, when you went down a rabbit hole that you really shouldn't have gone down? So, so um, I, I'm a huge proponent of customer discovery. Um, that is like the, the most important thing in our, our, our playbook, right? Uh, so for us, our, our first like four prototypes were completely 3D printed and we thought we were gonna save the world by like ultra low cost 3D printed hands. And then when we actually started talking with real patients and real uh, clinicians, the number one thing they complained about was that their, their super expensive um, machine like injection molded hand was breaking so if we gave them a 3d printed one they'd break it within a day of using it right and that would be a huge problem and that forced us to think outside of the box then right so it was like how can we still leverage like the low cost of 3d printing but make this like more robust than anything else that's when we came across the soft robotics literature and then we started making our fingers compliant and use 3d printed molds and um and flexible 3d printed filaments that make this thing much more robust and that was, I mean, that resulted in one of our patents, right? And our like compliant finger design in particular. So um, it takes it takes some creative thinking, but the the you you need to be just talking to the the people who are going to be using it at the end of the day because it's their needs that really drive um, what you need to build. Um, I have a question for Alex. Um, so Carolina, because um, I think as I mentioned before, there's a lot of people in this room who works on like. Um, multi channel um, neural interfaces. And I think one of the reasons is that the circuits um, community love the, the fact that there's a lot of challenges associated with it. And I went to the <laughs> neuropixel since when I started my PhD. That was like one of the, the, the neighbors that I was pointed to, like, oh, keep this, and that's what you're going to do. So we're starting to understand the problem. And so I wonder, other than research application, I wonder if neuropixel is thinking about other potential applications. Um, yeah. 
And yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, the answer is yes. Um, I think there's still a, a lot of room for the clinical application devices uh, to also increase uh, resolution, to increase number of channels, to increase the amount of information that we get. Uh, but of course, we discussed yesterday as well, there are many challenges to move from research to a clinical device that has nothing to do with the how fantastic your chip is, but more related to how do you make your device very robust and how you can really uh, make it uh, user friendly enough and how you make it safe enough as well. So uh, I think that's maybe the, the, the barrier that we need to cross uh, to, to go the extra step. But certainly, yeah, as I mentioned yesterday, we have managed to translate many of these jobs to the clinical lab, clinical research uh, in humans. And yeah, the, the, the feedback was super positive. They were amazed to be able to get so much data out of the human brain because that's not what they are used to. Uh, and they would like to see more of that. So I think uh, making that extra step also for uh, human application is very important. Uh, and of course, there are many other things around that, not just the just because signals that having this uh, opportunity to do simulation, closed loop, uh, uh, for many other uh, type of treatments. And uh, we yesterday we saw publications on epilepsy and all of this. I think that can also benefit a little bit, a little bit from uh, this uh, higher density. Also, things like robotics, uh, when people PMG or uh, other applications that also need uh, uh, sensing. Having also uh, high density uh, has shown to have some uh, value, but indeed, maybe not all the technologies have that to enable it. But I think having higher density is not that something that can come very good. Great. So there's a really important question I want to make sure we address here, and this applies both to the PIs and the founders. And when it comes to neurotechnology development and commercialization, I think the most important component is the team. So do you have any advice on building a team and for PIs who are recruiting grad students, you know, for example, are there things that you look out for? What, what separates the, the ones who are not so good versus the ones who are really going to be, you know, generating novel ideas and, and likewise for, for startups, like what are the critical things that you're looking for um, to make a productive and, you know, effective member of the team? I think for uh, for me, uh, uh, complementary knowledge is very important, right? Uh, and then uh, you know there are some other aspects that come later, like uh, how uh, the team can uh, work together towards the goal, towards the same goal. And uh, you know some some of the personal traits obviously come to the picture. So I was very fortunate to work with a number of individuals. Uh, who have been very, uh, very helpful. Uh, so my uh, experience, and in fact, they have very quick success as soon as we uh, wrote proposals to a number of organizations, overall we got like $10 million of research grant. So uh, I think I, I, uh, I believe that it is, uh, I, I give the credit to my collaborators and uh, the fact that they were, uh, they were willing to uh, go extra mile to understand what kind of language I am speaking, and what kind of language, uh, uh, how how the uh, expertise that you have in certain technology can be translated to uh, a particular application, in this case, like neural implants, um, it is really a credit to them. And no, I was very lucky. And um, I mean, it's very, very difficult to uh, figure out at the beginning uh, what the best team is. But uh, in terms of, if you look at the, from a professional perspective, uh, this complementary knowledge, I think, is very important. So we had, like, uh, in our team, for example, we had a neurologist who was really a hobbyist, and he clearly understood the knowledge of uh, the language that an electrical engineer was speaking. So that was really for us to, uh, for me to understand what's going on in the uh, whole domain of like neural implants and brain uh, brain machine interface, and also for him to. Uh, clearly and elegantly uh, transfer and translate some of the challenge that, challenges that exist and how we can basically kind of translate it to 
basic requirement and challenges for circuit. So that was really kind of, I think, our missing, uh, the missing puzzle for our uh, collaboration, which we found it very easy, was that neurologist who was very interested in doing like uh, circuit design. Okay, so that was really my, my own experience. Great. Yeah. I want to get a perspective too from some of the founders. So uh, Jacob and Adil, if you've got any advice for startup founders who are looking to grow their team. Yeah, so I don't think anyone should really take my advice and not too seriously. Like, you know, we're about a, not, not even a year into it. Uh, I'm very happy with how it's going though. I'm very keen um, and we're very late. Um, but uh, I have uh, just started the lab and the process so far has been extremely similar. Um, and my, there, I, I don't believe this is the only hiring philosophy. This is my hiring philosophy. It, it works really well at the lab. And that's to, to recruit um, attitude, like number one. So I'm looking mostly for um, like buy-in and um, like passion and some level of talent. You need one of the things about the one of my grad schools that are kind of above the bar. And I'll, I'll give you a quick anecdote. I, the, sorry, the, the reason why I think it's important is because you don't really know where you're going. You have a vague sense of where you're headed. And my son had a vague sense of where you're headed. Like, Similarly, it would make sense to be a million invasive, neural invasive. But if I have like a top neurosurgeon who's doing um, neuropsychiatric conditions, like that would be awesome. Why would I say, like, no, I'm going to try? Like, I have a preconceived notion of where we're going. And I think your team nucleates around like that talent. Uh, this happened in my lab. I want to hire people, promise people. There is no, no one really tries with that. So I hired like materials people and they're doing magnetic electrics, and that's where we are now. We're not part of our master plan. We hired the right talent. Um, and I think that your your company is going to kind of find the natural way that way. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, for us, it was, it was interesting how, how we recruited in particular, especially our, our early on. Um, we would look specifically for people who have done stuff outside of their classroom. And um, and there was a particular like um, a, like lab in uh, at the University of Illinois called the Open Lab, and the only rule there was that you weren't allowed to do homework there. It was meant specifically for people that were working on outside projects, right? And uh, Psionic, like before we were even a company, we were we were in that um, space where we were building like early prototypes with the hand and everything. And the the people that we had met there. They they were they were building like you know solar cars and like like um, robots and things like that for just personal projects or part of like um, student organizations and things like that. But in doing that process, a they were applying whatever they learned in their their classes, right? But they were doing it in the real world context where you know a lot of the, the theory that you learned isn't applied, right? Mm -hmm. um, or it's it's different, right? There's there's all sorts of environmental constraints, right? Um, so they know how to build something real and build something functional, and especially if you're building something like a car, it, it needs to be like like done properly. Otherwise, it, it, it can be dangerous, right? Uh, so that was that was one thing, right? Um, so when we looked at resumes, and if the only thing that was on your resume was like what you've done in your coursework, then that was like a, a red flag for us, right? Um, and we didn't we didn't necessarily care about your GPA. Like if your GPA was trash, but you like showed that you've done all these cool personal projects, that was phenomenal for us and then we wanted that that type of person and uh when we were initially hiring like um uh, uh, specifically like electrical engineers and mechanical engineers there were specific um uh, very specific things that we were looking for so if they knew how to do surface mount soldering um if they if they if they even knew what that was and like they, they could like speak to that then we knew that they knew how to like they knew what a microcontroller was they probably knew how to put a pcb design together and they probably knew how to code that as well right um, and on the mechanical side, if they knew how to do like um, surfacing, uh, which is like a, like a technique they use in CAD, um, then that was like, then, then they know how to build like really good models that can be easily 3D printed and, and, and things like that. And so that was kind of like our litmus test uh, for, for those uh, particular candidates. And it, it turned out to, it, it turned out to work pretty well because attitude thing was that these are the people who are going to like like do this stuff for fun anyway right. right and then it was like the technical side of that too they know how to do what we need them to do right great advice yeah find the hackers um any other comments or questions from the audience it's nice to see the other side and we have friends and think about confidence i was looking first of all fantastic panel and i really appreciate it. i was looking for the bias Maybe I missed it. I didn't see any engineering 
Some of the colleagues, I'm, I'm talking about the panel side. Do you suggest to, I mean, maybe I missed it, and you recommend uh, for the young people to consider, in addition to engineering, the youth in that and This is the one. And second one is engineers, the inventors are different than running the company in the CEO. Somehow the engineers, we are pragmatic people when we are working in the lab, but when we have one product, it becomes almost religion. Some people they get a little attached, and they do not understand that it's ninety-five percent of the people they fail in this business. So we need to this. We bring it to a certain level and drop it and start a company that other people run the company. We continue as an engineer doing the research. Thank you. It, it depends on, on the overall experience and depends on the complementarity of the team um, and the, the interest. So, I mean, on our end, for example, I, I don't have an MBA, but I've worked in strategy and finance for about 15 years. Our CEO is a remote MBA. Um, and we use all that skill set to help companies because oftentimes they don't have that skill set and for a while. I would say the roles that are typically popular with MBAs and vice versa, maybe product manager, product owner, where you need to understand the market, but also the engineering. So, I would say in engineering and an MBA would be particularly qualified and that would be useful as a CEO it depends right because of, you know if you do it before very useful if you're right in the midst of it you know I don't think adding an MBA to an already charged schedule would help but then the question is who else is on your team so if you have an engineer that has worked you know in very corporate positions that business development or again product management or anything else even maybe consulting I think they might have learned something that you know is akin to an MBA and it's not more useful so it, I would say the MBA is useful, but it's more about the profile. You know, is there someone in the team? Is there an advisor at least? Or is there a group of advisors or consultants, obviously preaching for my choir a bit, that can help in that regard? I think the biggest flaw we've seen is beyond the title is just forgetting the fact that this is a business. If you choose to make it a business, it is not a lab project. And I think making that shift mentally is not always easy. And that's maybe somewhere where an MBA profile might come from another angle. They might be missing a lot of the you know reality of an tech company, but at least they'll bring a new perspective to the table, and you know the overall solution might make sense together. Yeah, that's a great answer. If if I could add my two cents there too, I think there's a certain time you want to bring on a CEO in a company too. So if you're at a smaller stage and you you eventually want to bring on a CEO. The, the kind of CEO you'll bring on at the early stage is very different to a later stage where you've established some traction. So if you're in the medical device space, you want to bring on a CEO who's, you know, got experience with Medtronic, Boston Scientific, but they're not interested in working with small stage companies. So there's really a, an appropriate time to bring them on, I think. Any other questions? Can I ask about risk tolerance? I, uh, I started a neurotech company nearly 10 years ago before the brain initiative. And uh, this was an invasive device, and I would pitch it to investors with a big dream, and they would all say, wow, amazing technology. What a great vision. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, and now I look around, and I see so many uh, really exciting companies. Um, but what I know to be a very long, very expensive and risky arc of development, um, getting funded, getting getting well funded. And I'm kind of wondering how how has risk tolerance changed? Because the FDA has not changed that much in the last 10 years from, from the time that I was So as a VC, we don't like to take risks which is contrary to what the purpose of a VC firm is. Oh, sorry. So uh, as a VC firm, we, we like to be as risk-free as possible, okay? So if you look at all multiple parameters to make it uh, acceptable, because you still got to answer to your investors, why did you go down this route? Uh, back to the question about do they need an MBA. We don't look at MBAs. We look at the experience of the individual attitude is a big difference, okay? How they present themselves and understand the logic of how they came about their tech development on their financials, on their business development strategy. What is the logic that doesn't make sense, okay? And it, 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 it's a numbers game. To get funded, how many people do you have to coach? Uh, from VC perspectives or it, it, it's like, 
I get in my inbox mail maybe about 10, 10, 20 requests a week. A lot of them I just flush. None of them catch my eye. Okay. Uh, a lot of it's based on networking. I think you had talked about that earlier. It's meeting on investors. And there has to be some sort of affinity between you and that investor. Okay. It was probably held the last two years because of the pandemic. You can really meet, especially when you're at pre seed level. When you're pre seed level, you got no proof that what you're doing works. Yes, yeah, great, you publish a paper. Doesn't mean anything for an investor. There has to be some sort of proof, the prototype uh, market traction, but a pre seed is harder. So then it comes back to you and the investor. What do you like each other? Because you have to believe in each other for them to invest in you. Okay. So the more people you meet, the better it is. How many people? It could be ending up in the thousands. Okay. And I was working with a startup, and probably Adam can attest to that too, because you work with all startups. Is you know, so the startup, we went through a list of over a few thousand investors to meet the criteria. You were talking about invasive, non-invasive, and med tech devices. Invasive is you have to get that particular investor that's willing to do that, and there's not many out there. There's very few and far between, but you have to go through a list after list after list to find out who they are, and you keep got to go on the website. And then the website may have a dozen partners there, so which one has a better affinity with you based on their background? Do you think there are many more now than there used to be? There's more VCs out there, yes. That are willing to invest in, in invasive neurotechnology? Not necessarily. Oh, well, okay, I should have mentioned that because uh, I should leave that to Ariane and, and Adam uh, because we've invested more in IT. Okay. Uh, we've gotten stuff that's in the med tech in general, and we would not need it. We would depend on Ariane and Adam to help us digest it. It doesn't make sense. So that's why you may need an investor, you may need Ariane, and she, yeah, okay, I see what you're doing, but if she, but I may not invest in that, but I may know someone who would. And you gotta try and convince them, hey, can you connect me with that person? With that person. Sure, thank you. <laughs> um, well, first of all, kudos to you for, for starting a company that long ago before the Brain Initiative. I'm, it's a testament to, I mean, uh, the ingenuity and the boldness and creativity that you must have had at that time. Um, you know, uh, answering your question about risk aversion and you know how is that developing? I mean, it's constantly evolving right now. I mean, the fact that we are all in this place together, gathering here to discuss really interesting uh, types of design criteria, um, really pushing those fields forward. I mean, it's it's an unprecedented time and. Um, the engagement of, of the government uh, funding and, and the dialogues that are currently happening across the different um, offices there, including the FDA and uh, re regulatory reimbursement offices. Um, I think that all of these things are really essential for us to get to a point where we are all, you know, at another level of our risk, uh, our understanding of the risk. And so earlier I mentioned, yes, I am very optimistic about uh, early stage. Uh, novel technologies for precision neuroscience. And I do think that that's a feature that that needs to be, you know, that that will be there and um, needs to have additional funding and, and additional risk takers that really understand, you know, what the stake here, how long things take, um, what that R&D process is going to be like and how much capital is actually going to be required. And I think founders are trying to figure that out as well as VCs. Um, there aren't a lot of VCs who are, who are who have an exclusive investment thesis in invasive DPI. Um, and I would tell you that, you know, uh, for, for myself, you know, it, it, would, it would have to be a, a diversified approach, right? You've got both the invasive hardware as well as the you know, wearable solutions and understanding where the pros and cons are there and what the impact can be on uh, in each of those. Um, and um, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be, it's going to be evolving. Um, and uh, but 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 you know the folks who I've spoken to within the venture community, there are PhDs in neuroscience that are people who have um, uh, broader experience commercially who who can connect the dots 
much better than they may have the experience long ago. And um, the fact that there are, there are people who are more entrepreneurial in this academic space, um, it's, it's really a, a sign of, of future growth. So hopefully, you know, we'll be able to understand that better. But of course, there are the challenges. Um, the the range of employment is dynamic, um, and uh, you know, I think that the, given the the incentives that um, the non dilutive grant funding is being brought, and the, the very you know awesome calls for the, the research programs, I think they're really on point. And if we have VCs that can align themselves with those efforts, um, that will serve to mitigate some of the risks in people time. Great. I'm sorry. I don't know. Well, Jacob, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you. So I, I don't know what um what the key risks were when you were raising. I know what the many risks that they identified when, when we've been talking to them. I think maybe the difference now versus the sentiment that existed pre for initiative is related both to maybe a lower risk given the fact that there's a diversity of technology that are supporting the community. And I think importantly, a greater upside. One of the big challenges of med tech is that the exits are very small, right? It was like 10 years, $100 million. And then you're talking like it's $200 million, $300 million. Exit. This is like not what VCs are looking for for the most part. And so, raising for traditional med tech is really hard. What has changed is that I think some of these companies are pitching themselves as pharma companies or as tech companies. And so they're they're getting different valuations. I think um, IOS acquisition to Estellas helped a lot. So hopefully you guys are going to start companies selling to pharma or um, get that kind of tech valuation. And I think as you start to realize that there's more opportunities beyond just selling your device to Medtronic, then that creates a lot more infusion of capital to support small ambitious companies. Yeah. So a, a lot has been said. What I would add is you know maybe our philosophy when we help startups and, and even scale ups is you need to do a lot of preparation to prove your points. So there is information available on the market. There are public companies in the field of neurotech that have actually gone public. I can't say they've been performing that well, so you don't have to take your argument. But you know, do a very thorough perspective. What's my roadmap? When am I going to get to market? Be super realistic about cost. If you go to a VC and say, yeah, well, I'll do my rec cost, you know, my regulatory plan, I'm class three, but it's going to cost X, probably going to do a lot more. Be realistic. But if you also do a very thorough analysis of the market you're trying to solve, again, going back to the patient, you might actually show that there's a lot of potential upside. So I would say there are more VCs, as you said, as you've all said, that are aware of Eurotech. Some of them have invested in invasive Eurotech. Some of them have invested and maybe are not too happy about it. Others might be happy. Others might be curious about it. But it's not what it was. But it doesn't prevent the fact that there's a lot of preparation work to do because if you're there and you're not able to answer the questions, eventually going back to risk, market risk too high and or technological risk is too high, I'm not getting better. So the market is better, but there's a lot of work to do. And I would say the current dynamic when we talk to VC, the, there is still dry powder. They still need to invest. And as we said, you know, if you think about next year, I don't think there's not going to be any deals. There are probably going to be quite a few. But maybe the burden of proof and you know what a startup has to show is to defend the valuation and to defend the race might just be a little bit higher than it would have been a year or two ago. But the information is there. There are people that can help. I, I think the you know the horizon is green in my mind. One more question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the Eurotech market. I was wondering if Brooks and then the uh, investor side could comment on whether or not it helps to have an NIH grant. Like, what's the numbers on all this time it takes several years to get one of these grant initiative grants? You get it, you have to have partners to be able to do it, you're going to make something. What's the numbers on just that make investors later like it more because that? Maybe it's a little more sure thing or not. And I think it'd be really helpful to know whether or not there's numbers on what this investment over the last 10 years is. How many of those went and are actually moving toward, you know, a startup or commercial? And did it matter? Because we heard, you know, from the hand that you decided that you were going to go the commercial route. And you know, Jacob, you know, kind of split his bets and he's still here. The hesitation, and then I'm hearing that well, you know, you gotta have everything worked out before you do it, and then when you file, 
something, your institution lets you stop doing the work that you need to do it for your course to go to be that. So I, I'd love to hear thoughts on that because that seems attention. All right, so to answer your first part of your question, I think that, well, it hasn't been 10 years, and a lot of projects we're funding in the translational space have not been completed, as you well know. So we really don't have any metrics to go on to see how many are being you know, funded by VC, but I would certainly say if they wouldn't have been funded by VC, that they went straight to them and not to us first. Uh, you know, on average, we're, we're funding up to five-year projects between five and fifteen million dollars for something that's not proven so that they can get safety and, and feasibility data to de-risk it uh, further. And even after they come out of these programs, they still might need to come back in uh, to do further uh, research uh, and maybe even go for traditional feasibility, which in INDS we have pathways and study pathways for traditional feasibility studies. But we even have some efficacy studies but in a specific indication. So, so we do provide some of the things that you might actually go to VCs for if you have the indication that's being uh, funded and again, the funding opportunity should look at, at what we're funding, um, but we don't fund everything. So, Yeah, so um, I think I think what you're also noticing is that um, there there's a large funding gap and knowledge gap at the pre seed and series seed, uh, specifically in, in neurosciences and neurotechnology. Um, you know, that, that does currently exist, and, and I think that the, there's been a lot of efforts um, on the NIH side, on the DARPA side, to kind of bring forward a lot of these new programs. Um, and and with an eye for commercialization and and translational science, um, but the the VC community um, at the early stage has not quite yet picked up, which kind of causes you know uh, the entrepreneurs to think creatively about how to get their first level funding in. Most most uh, neurotech founders actually uh, their first round of funding are from from Asia. And um, there's not a lot of institutional and VC on the cap table. Um, and it also they, they also hold those rounds open for a lot longer um, than the average uh, biotech or life sciences founder, uh, where there are established venture funds, you know, ranging in size up to the billions, you know, um, to, to like larger checks in these more popular areas. Um, and and uh, the neurotech founders they usually do take you know twice as long uh, to close those rounds. Um, you know, in addition, they they do have higher high capital needs depending on if they are uh, need to go into um, clinical studies um, in a certain amount of time. And um, so certainly the the uh, having non dilutive grant funding can really push that company forward and give them an advantage in the way that. Um, you know, actually enables survival in some ways. Um, and uh, I think I, I've seen a view come across uh, my desk that um, have had a large amount of that funding and they've gone you know, very uh, far into the, their R&D development, their prototyping. Um, and it gives me a lot more, um, you know, uh, uh, it makes things a little bit more palatable when they're presenting and kind of their their next um, uh, steps, um, and so uh, I do think it, it's certainly helpful. Um, but again, I am one of the probably few institutional VCs in this space um, who, who has a dedicated interest to that, and um, so hopefully there'll be more uh, upcoming. But it's, it's definitely even as a VC in this space, an uphill. Line to uh, interpret and, and evaluate this the market is rapidly changing. Um, so, so if you get SBR funding, whether it's through NIH or NSF, uh, kudos, congratulations if you do that because they are not easy to get. So it gives you credibility to a VC. So you're removing a risk for that VC. And that's what you always want to look. How am I removing risk factors? And that's one way of doing it, getting these funds. 
I'll share actually, I haven't had that experience. Um, the feedback I've had is that none of the VCs I've talked to look at an NIH grant as a seal of approval and helps them then go with them. You know, if I got SDR3, they're still going to do their diligence just as hard on, on what we're doing. I think what is most valuable is the first check into the company when it's hard to raise from the venture. If you get farther along, the feedback I've had is why are you wasting your time writing these grants? Like, you should be working on these other things. Now, in the market climate, they're looking at this as runway extensions. They're like, okay, can you extend your runway a little bit by getting an NIH grant? That's changed a little bit about that six months, but when I was first raising, they basically said if you can get in without going to an NIH, you're a lot faster. And they look at your publication and your prior track record coming in is enough to back it up. So I should let you know. Whatever you're asking. <laughs> uh, I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, I think in general, the question is optimization, right? So the, the, the stigma, if it's non dilutive, is are you doing research or to your point, are you actually doing something for the company? And so you also get a bigger amount. So if you get a larger amount, you say, well, even if I consider that some of it might not be as useful specifically versus if I had private money and gone directly for what I want, it's it's a balance of how much you're getting versus how much you can achieve and if that can impact your roadmap. In general, though, again, I think there's a very positive, uh, I would say, appreciation for how hard it is to get them. The amounts are significant. It'd be back very solid scientific projects. So it's from what we've seen always positive, but we have seen challenges from investors that say, look, you know, given your roadmap, is that the best route? And as you said, Jacob, I think in the past, you know, circumventing and just going directly for private capital might have been a better route, but it's changing a little bit just from, you know, just to the de risking perspective. But if it's heavy RD and you can get five to 15 million, then typically speaking, I mean, an investor essentially can re-leverage from this. It's money that will just help them not spend, but still have the project move forward. So it, it remains, I would say, positive as long as it doesn't factor up not too much. Great. So I think with that, we'd like to thank all the panelists. It's been an amazing discussion. So many you know, great tips and great advice. So yeah, thanks again for sharing all this, these insights. So um, yeah, thank you again. Thank you.